Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. All right, as Miss Annabelle gets ready to read the word, I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while, and I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word, please, and thank you. And she'll be reading from Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Amen. Thank you, Miss Annabelle. Yeah. Treehouse kids, you are dismissed. May God add a blessing to the readers and the hearers of his holy word. Well, good morning. Good morning. Oh, you can take your seats in the place. Uh, I'm Pastor Joseph, one of the pastors here on staff, and if this is your first time, I am grateful for you being here to come fellowship as we are still in this sermon series, The Gospel of Mark. Uh, If you don't know this, we will be in this sermon series in and out for almost a year-ish, right? And so you'll see this for a while. So just get ready. You're going to know all of Mark, everything in it. And if you have questions over Mark, over this sermon, or even just random stuff, On Pastor Plex podcast, where we talk faith, culture, and everything in between, Uh, you can send in your questions. You can text them. You can even go to pastorplex.com and send in a voicemail if you want to do. Once your voice on there, if if you want, you can do it. All right. So I'm going to assume if you're texting and stuff, you're either reading your Bible or you're texting questions. Man, tough crowd today. I see. (laughs) Y'all are tougher than the first service. Oh my goodness. Well, how's your week been? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so, so for me this week, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, my wife met someone at the park, which is not, first off, that's a blessing in itself because she doesn't uh, naturally engage with strangers. And so she met someone at the park. Our daughters were playing around, and she ch- exchanged numbers. This is Holy Spirit-led for sure because she does not do that. Uh, normally, she's been doing it more often. And, and so she, she came to me on Wednesday. She said, hey, I met someone. Kali played well with her. I'm like, oh, that's exciting, good stuff. And then she said, hey, you got plans on Friday? I'm like, oh, my gosh. In my mind, that's what I said. Because, you know, for, I don't know about you, but when my wife says, do you have plans, that means she's already made plans. <laughs> All right, that's, that's for me. And so I was, in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't have plans and I don't want to have plans. Uh, but I said, no, nah, I don't have plans. What's going on? She said, well, I set up something. Kylie had a new friend. They had fun, and we're meeting with him on Friday. And I'm thinking in my mind, man, so you met him on Wednesday. We already going to see him again? Like, golly, that's quick. And so we go to the swimming pool on Friday, and Kylie Bears is super excited about showing her new friend all her blow-up toys and stuff that she gets to swim in. And so the first thing we do, we blow up the, the, the boat that they get to sit in, and Kylie says, come on. And they jump in, and Kylie's steering, and her friend is behind them, and by, like, they start cruising in the boat. And by cruising, I mean I'm pushing them around, you know. And so we're going through all that, and we're swimming. Then they switch, and they're having fun, and they're laughing and playing, and it's super exciting for the four-year-olds to have all this fun. Well, next we get to the tubes, and Kylie has her special tube. And she's playing in her tube. She's jumping in the water into her tube, and she's having fun. And then when she gets out of the water, she takes like two steps away. Her friend jumps in it. Boom. And Kylie sees her friend jump in, and she's like, hmm, that's mine. It starts to whine and cry, and I'm like, Kylie, what's the matter? She was like, she's swimming. And there's like three other tubes she can swim in. But, oh, that's mine. I want it. And she turns around, and then walks all the way over to the splash pad mad, and there's like, <laughs> I'm laughing at her. But uh, not, I know, y'all can, whatever. <laughs> And she, there's this little mushroom kind of waterfall and a little splash pad, and she goes underneath it just <laughs> soaking. I'm like, Connie, get over here. I said, it's okay to share. She said, no, I want it. You know, that's my Kylie voice. Uh, I said, it's okay to share. Now, I'm thinking in my mind, this is the same girl. Like, this past week, I was eating, you know, my thin mint cookies, and she said, Dad, can I have one? I said, no. She said, but Dad, sharing is caring. I'm like, I'm like, oh, so now I wanted to tell her, you know, sharing is care, but I can't do that because, you know, the Bible teaches us we not have to, you know, for, for kids and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so she, she never, she, she just couldn't get over this, this sharing and, and letting her friend do it and 
because she wanted it her way right then and there. Like, this is mine. I want it. And I, I was thinking about that, and I was watching, and of course, God gives you something when you do, do all those different things. But I said, man, we treat uh, Christ's authority over our lives the same way. Right? We don't, we, we, we don't want or we don't recognize his authority in our life. We're not thinking about it. And I said, well, what are some ways we do that? I said, well, first off, it's my glory, my good. Right? It's all about me. It's all about what I want, when I want, and how I want it. And so, God, if your agenda isn't in alignment with mine, eh, I'm cool with that because I want what I want. My glory, my good. I want to be out front. I want you to know my name. I want you to recognize who I am and what I've done. It's easy. It's mine. This is me. I did that. I put that on. I, I organized and put all that together. It was me. Another way we can resist or not recognize uh, Jesus' authority over our lives is Jesus has it wrong. Well, what do you mean? For some of us, we're, God may have gave you a, a helpmate that you don't like right now. And you're asking yourself, God, did you, did you make a mistake? Is this one really for me? God, I remember I prayed for a job and you gave it to me and I thanked you. But now that I'm kind of going through this, I don't really want it anymore. Like, I don't like it like that no more, God. I mean, I thank you back then, but can we shift this thing? Because I think you messed up. Or maybe this, this person you're asking me to speak to, God, it's like, I, like, I hear you. But it's, a, it's not what I want. It's an inconvenience, right? Because this last one is Jesus is too extra. You want me to do all of that? You want me to sacrifice my time, my talents, my giftings for all of that? Like, I mean, I can be doing better things with my time. Way better things with my time. Right? So you want me to, and, and this, so this is where we're going on this morning. Kind of talking about and recognizing Jesus' authority over our lives and our response to that. What does that mean for us, really? Should I really be doing something? Or am I okay with this Sunday relationship that I have with Jesus? That's not, it's, it's really just centered around what I do here. And then from here, I'll see you next week. Jesus, I might talk to you on Wednesday if I need you. Right, but for the most part, I want to be able to operate in my own strength. I want to do my own thing. That's what I recognize is that if I can't do it, then nobody's going to do it for me. So I need to step up, handle my business. God, if I need you, I'll call on you. God, if I need you, you know, I might let you drive for a little bit, but for the most part, I'll handle this. And we're not willing to submit to that authority. So that's where we're going on this morning. If you would, bow your heads and pray with me for a second. Father God, we thank you. God, I truly believe there, there is none like you. So God, as we jump into this text and uh, we fellowship with you through your word, God, and we, we grow in our understanding of what you've called us to do and our relationship with you, God, what you've called us to do and our faith walk with you, God, what you've called us to do, God, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts and our minds, God, remove any distractions or anything not like you. God, we love you and God, we praise you. It's all these things we, I ask, or we ask, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And so if you would open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, we'll start at verse 7. For those of you that may have missed last week, if we, Chris finished up uh, talking about how Jesus healed this uh, man's withered hand on the Sabbath. We were talking about the Sabbath day. And the, the Pharisees and all like the religious leaders, they were there. And they're like, man, we got to do something about this dude. He crazy. So they're ready to kill him. Like you got this group of Pharisees and Herodians that they don't really get along. But the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they're like, hey, let's make this coalition. Let's get together. Let's, let's get rid of this dude, Jesus. And so this is where verse 7 picks up. And it says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. Everyone, real quick, I want you to say withdrew. withdrew. It's okay to... Relax sometimes, and we find in the book of Mark, at least 11 times, where Jesus retires from work, right? The reasons he would do it is, well, he was trying to escape people killing him. That's one. Some of the other ways he would do it is he just wanted to have some quiet time with the Lord. He may have wanted some private conversations, or maybe he wanted to talk to just his disciples. 
But I believe, and even in the Word of God, it shows us it's, so, it's okay to withdraw from the world, the distractions, the things that are literally trying to kill you. For some of us, it's emotionally, mentally, spiritually. There are things that are pulling from us and trying to get us away from God. And so we have to remove ourselves from it. It could be that job. It could be those kids, loved ones. But having quiet time with the Lord, a retreat, a removal of self from the world is important. And then it tells us, and a great crowd followed him. Everyone say great crowd. That's important. We'll come back to it from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, so south and really south and north and really north, from beyond the Jordan, so east and, uh, uh, and from around Tyre and Saddam. Uh, When the great crowd, there it goes again, heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And so for some of us, you think, well, what is this, a few hundred people? No, this is thousands of people making, you know, 95, 90 to 100 mile journeys on foot. Not from what they seen, because there's no TV, no social media or anything like that, but from what they heard. So people are talking about Jesus, and they're willing to walk to San Antonio to experience this. They don't know if it's true. Is it hype? I don't know. But I'll walk 100 miles just to see who this man is. And here we are in a world where I can give a message out thousands of miles. And we still, we're still not going to see Jesus. What would it take for this message to get out to the world? For this message to be personal, personal for us? For, for us to be willing to take it to people that need it? And he told his disciples to have a boat ready, which Jesus often did for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. So you have these thousands of people. Imagine like a concert or something. They're trying to get to whoever that person is, that star or whatever. They're trying to get to him so much so that they might kill him. And so now I'm thinking, well, what's going on? Well, verse 10 says, for he had healed many. So they're coming because of what they heard, him healing, and what he had started doing, killing those around, so that all that had diseases pressed around him to touch him. So I'm willing to crush Jesus just to touch him to be healed. And so he's going around healing, and it's like, I know he can heal me. Let me just touch him. And they're focused so much on the touch, the text leads us to believe that they're not worried about what he's teaching. So they're missing the message. And how, and how often is it that, God, I want the blessing, but I don't want you to tell me what I need to do to get it. I don't want the message behind it. God, I I, I want the money, but I don't really want to work the hours to do it. God, can I just go on my job and not do nothing and not tell them and just get paid for it? Please. Like, I know I'm supposed to be here eight hours, but I can do eight hours of work in two hours. So those other six hours, I'm going to just scroll on social media, whatever it is that I'm going to do. God, do I really have to invest in my family? Like, is that really important? Can't I just have a family and we look good on the outside? Do I really need to spend time with my wife? God, do I really have to do these things? So we want the blessing. We, we, we want to look good. And we want the world to see us and it, it feel like we have everything together without God really pruning us and removing things in our lives that are distracting us or pulling us away from our relationship with God. And so even in this crowd of people, God, or Jesus came up against some demons. And so when you see this unclean spirits, he's talking about demons. So it says that whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. So even the demons knew of the authority of Jesus Christ. So even people out there respond to his authority. Even his enemies responded to who he was. And the people around and the Pharisees that are 
students of the law and, and should know that he's there, they weren't responding. They're actually looking to kill him. And so what happens is he went up to the top of the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And this mountain, you, you hear it in, you see it in Exodus when Moses goes up to the mountain and God is speaking to him. But this, it's this imagery of being close to God. That's what these mountaintop experiences kind of give us, this closeness to God. And so he goes up to this mountain and he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And so this is setting us up for him calling those 12 disciples. And he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have an authority to cast out demons. I don't know if you caught this, but while I was reading this, one of the things I saw was that so that they might be with him. The first thing God gave me in this was that our relationship with him has to be personal. So he called these 12 disciples and said, hey, I need you to come up here on the mountain. I need time with you. I want you to be with me. Our relationship with God has to be a personal experience, meaning I have to spend time with him. I have to know him. My son, uh, the youngest one, Alexander, Mr. Alexander the Great, has recently started walking, right? Ten months, he's doing his walking thing. And at first, you know, they take the first couple steps and you're like, oh, this is cool. But then you turn around and they're just kind of doing a little walk. So you're like, oh, snap, you about to hit. You start chasing them around. And so what we do to exercise these legs, I sit across one, I'm I'm sitting across the room from my wife and I let him walk and that's him right there. So that's my baby. It's okay. He hears daddy's voice. And I, and I sit him down or stand him up and I let him start walking. His mom says, come here, Alexander. He starts walking across the floor to mom. Mom grabs him. Cool. And then daddy sits down on the ground and and I'm like, come here, Alexander. He looks at me like, So I go back and get him, and I try again. He goes to his, it's like, all right, call him. She calls him. He walks, does his little walking thing. He literally, like, this this last time I did it, she tried to send him to me. He looked at me and said, (laughs) and went back to his mom. I was like, what in the world? But mom was with Alexander. He is fed from mama. He sleeps next to mama. When he cries, mama picks him up. Daddy does it. But let him cry. But there's a personal relationship that even a 10-month child knows who mommy is, knows where comfort comes from, knows where peace comes from. And so when Alexander is hurting and, and it's a cry of, I'm hungry, mama interprets that. When it's a cry of, I got something in my diaper and I need you to take it out. Mama knows that cry. When it's just, I don't want to be on the ground, mama knows. Because there's there's a relationship and it's personal and she knows him. God wants that relationship with us. He wants it to be personal. He wants us to experience him in that manner. That's that's why he said, so they might be with me. And then he said, and he might send them out to preach. And so there's a process. There's an order of operation. Before I can preach, I got to have a personal relationship with them. Before I find my purpose in him, there has to be a personal relationship with them. And so too often we are advocates of the word versus witnesses of the word. Or what's the difference? An advocate, it's, it's like that, that, that court-appointed lawyer that doesn't really know your case, that stands in front of a judge, versus someone who's spent time with you, has listened to your story, understands your story. It's one of those, right? It's the, the, the sacrifice and, and understanding that I'm willing to, for me as a father, I'll inconvenience myself for my kids before I inconvenience myself for you all. And I think you all can say the same thing. Hey, I'll inconvenience myself for my husband or my, my friend before you do me if you don't know me. But that personal relationship. So before we can preach, we have to have a personal relationship. But there's purpose behind it. We're called to go sent out, be sent out. But I can't be sent out if I don't have a personal relationship. So it's not one, either or first. No, personal relationship. Then I go out with my purpose and begin to preach what he's given me. And so after that, we see that he says... First is personal, 
Then there's purpose because he sends us out to preach. And then it says, and have authority to cast out demons. And so then we can operate in the power because we have relationship and we know who he is and we know the power he has and we know the authority he speaks in and operates him. Oh, so I have access to that same power, but I can only understand that as if I have a personal relationship with him. Right? I can't go out and preach and tell people about who God is from an outside view. Because my story is not your story. The people that I'll be able to connect with aren't the people you'll be able to connect with. The room I'm able to sit in isn't always the room you're able to sit in. Why? Because God gave you your story that he wants you to use to reach the people he's called you to reach and witness to. We're not here to, to advocate Jesus, but be witnesses of him because of what he's did in our personal lives. That's what makes the story real. Because it becomes real to me first. Amen? Amen. So true disciples operate from Jesus' authority. True disciples operate from Jesus' authority. I was, uh, so my Saturdays for the last like eight weeks have been at track meets. I'm a track coach. I head coach my son's team. Uh, We had a few athletes and it was great. But the problem with that is that in, in Texas heat, if you've never been a track parent, it's hot. And you're out there for like 13, 14, 15 hours a day. Like, like I'm there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Last night we were done at 10 o'clock at night. Oh, Jesus. I was tired. My kids, the only good thing about it is that by the time I make it home, my kids are asleep. Like, they try to stay awake. And J4 was like, Dad, I'm hungry. I'm like, okay, get you something to eat. And he's eating, falling asleep. I'm like, yes. That's the only time they fall asleep without, like, me fighting them. He goes to bed on his own. But the guy that did it, there's thousands of people at these meets. And the guy that is over it, he, uh, his name is Carmen Kier. And my mom said, oh, I know Carmen. We go way back, all this kind of stuff. I was like, oh, okay. And so at 10 o'clock at night, I'm, a, I'm about to walk out, and I see him kind of setting up every, or pulling down everything, breaking it down. I said, hey, I want to pr- just thank you for doing this for the kids. I really appreciate it. My kids love it. He's like, oh, okay. He asked someone, I said, I'm Joseph. My mother told me to tell you hello. You know, I try to name drop real quick. So her name is Patricia, and I'm telling oh, Miss Pat. Oh, my God, tell her I said. And then he starts going into all the different stories. And he said, so you come from good stock, huh? I'm like, I guess so. I mean, you know, mom, she's like, yeah, she good people. I know your people. And, and so we begin to engage now because of this relationship that he had with my mom. He felt like he knew me. He said, I'm going to be watching you now. You coming to my track meet next month? And I'm thinking, about, nah, we done. I ain't going no more. I didn't say it. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I might see you. Probably not, you know. I got a couple kids that are going to run it. I might go see them. I might. You know. uh, but, but the relationship now is there. He said, I know you now. I know you. And the good thing about this, and I, and I love this, is that we operate from the authority of who Jesus is, and so we get to name drop him. If there's any name that I get to name drop, it's the name of Jesus. So I get to tell you that, oh, yeah, he can save you. He can fix that situation. Well, how do you know? Because he did it for me. How do you know? It's personal. There's a personal relationship, so I can tell you what he's done for me in my life and how he's done it, how he's fixed it. It's personal. Look at verse 20. Then he went home. There's no place like home, right? Nah, I'm not here. <laughs> and it's, look, it says, and the crowd gathered again. And so here Jesus is trying to, it says, so that they could not even eat. So here Jesus is with his disciples, with his boys, they're hanging out trying to relax from doing all this ministry, trying to retreat, and the people come to the house. They're climbing in the windows, and, and they open the door. They're just trying to get in, trying to see Jesus. And so when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. Jesus' own family heard about this. They're not at the house. They're somewhere out. They're traveling in. Again, the word got out. They said, man, this dude crazy. Any of y'all got family members that think you're crazy because of your love for Jesus? That's okay. I can be crazy because I love Jesus. We should be okay with that. And then it just stops that story. We're going to come back to it, but it stops. It'll make sense later. It says, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed with Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons, he cast out the demons. So Jesus, son of God. These Pharisees, these scribes, everyone seeing them like, boy, this dude, the devil, healing people, telling them about God. He's possessed. And he called them to him, saying, come here, let me talk to you. And he's, remember, he's at the house. He's chilling. 
And he said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. So here they are saying, Jesus, you like a triple agent. Like you try to pretend like you really on our side, but you on their side, you on this side. He's like, I'm on God's side. I ain't none of y'all agents. I'm here for God. This is what I'm here to do. This is what he's called us to. But what he does is he tells them, how can Satan, how can the owner of a house go against himself in his own house? He said, that's ludicrous. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And so if Satan is literally casting out Satan, then he's killing himself. He's trying to get them to understand and fathom that. Satan is really trying to kill himself. He's like, that doesn't even make sense. But watch this principle in this. If a kingdom is divided by, against itself, it will, it will die, is what he's saying. So that principle, what if we use that in the church? What happens when the church is divided? It's dying. What happens when we have a group of people not wanting to talk to this group of people in the church? It's dying. Because you remember, I'm not just talking about Wells Branch, because remember, we are the church. So when I go outside these, these double doors over here, I'm representing a kingdom of God. And so if there's certain groups of people that I don't like hanging around or doing, it's like if we're all a part of kingdom and I'm divisive and I don't like what you do because of the, the way you vote. I don't like what you do because of the food that you eat. I don't like what you do because of the way you talk. We're divided within ourselves. That means we're dying. I'm just talking about the kingdom. This is what it says. And so he gives them this parable. He said, and if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan, so, so even with this, so first the house is dying, but if we're divided within ourselves, we're not strong enough to stand. So we can't get through adversity. But he says, if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man. Everyone say strong man. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Y'all, this right here is, this is pure gold. You say, why, Pastor Joseph? Look what he's saying. He's saying, I can't come into Satan's house and take back. The, I, I grew up, and there was a song we say, I went to the enemy's camp, and I took back what he stole from me. Right? The only way I can go into a strong man's camp, tie him up, is if I'm stronger than him. So, I, so it, it's the emphasis of strong man, meaning the devil has power, but I have more. Mine is Holy Spirit driven. So I'll go into this house. I bind him up. Now I can do what I need to do in here because y'all are missing it. God doesn't want us to miss this. He's stronger than the devil. He's stronger than those things that are trying to distract us. He's stronger than those addictions. He's stronger than the enemy. And so when we're trying to operate in our own power, in our own strength, when we're trying or we're thinking that, God, you don't know what's right for me. God, I know how to do this. Let me tell you how I need to solve this problem. Please, I know how to get through this. He's saying, you don't know how to do it. I'm powerful enough. You need to operate from my authority is what God wants us to understand. To understand. So he goes in and then he says, then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all he's saying is I speak from the authority of God, with the authority of God. Truly, to start a sentence like that. I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemes, blasphemies that they utter, or they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. What is he saying? He says, look, if you accept me as your Lord and Savior, you're good. I can forgive all those sins. He said, but when you start to believe that my power comes from the devil, eh, eternal sin. Can't, can't help you there. When you think that I'm not pulling from the Holy Spirit, sorry, I can't save you there. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. He's trying to get them to see the picture. So the experts of the law did not recognize Jesus' authority. We were just sitting down right there, and when Joni came up doing the announcements on the screen, my four-year-old daughter said, I told you. Look at that magic screen right there. Right? She spoke from this, just, just ignorance. She doesn't know. It's just a projector up there. She said, it's magic, Daddy, look. She thinks she knows, and she, she goes by from her experience. 
And what Jesus is trying to do, he's saying it's more than just a touch. I'm trying to teach you something. But they don't want to be taught. They're experts. They're like, this is what we do. And for some of us, our stubbornness, our pride gets in the way of, of Jesus trying to move in our lives, trying to reveal some things to us, trying to show us that we're so close to the picture that we can't see it. He says, I need you to step back and see what I'm doing in your life. See what I'm doing in this ministry. See what I'm doing through you. See what I'm doing to you. Because there are doors you're trying to walk through that you weren't built or designed to walk through. He says, I want to take you places, but you got to trust me. You're not an expert. He is. He says, well, let me do it. And so watch this. I'm about to finish. I told you we're going to come back. This is verse 21 where it said, and when his family heard it, they went out and seized him. That means to capture, almost to arrest. Anywhere else you see that, it's like arrest. It's talking about prison, like contain him. It says, for they were saying he is out of his mind. So remember, we read this. We said we're going to come back to it. And then it comes all the way back 10 verses, 11 verses later in 31. This is, called, this is like a chiastic way of writing. You will see this a lot in Mark. Chris will bring it up when he preaches again. But it's where you say, hey, I'm going to talk about A. Then I'm going to go to B, then I'm going to come back to A, right? That's all it is going back and forth. It says, and his mother and his brothers came. So they finally make it down. They didn't travel down. There. And standing outside, they sent to him and called him. This could have been because of the great multitude that they couldn't even get into the house. It could be that they wanted to talk to Jesus in private and say, hey, yo, come out, man. You, you're talking silliness. This is the response. It says, and a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And you, I, I'll even go back. Who did he leave out in this? The father, right? Because even in figurative language, there's only one father. Jesus is just good like that. It says, in looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. And so intimately, He's sitting down and he's teaching these people. He's surrounded around this great multitude. These are the disciples, people that are listening to him teach. He's been summoned by his family. And I don't know about you, but if my family calls me and I don't pick up the phone, they get mad at me. Especially like the close ones. If my wife, what you doing? You better be talking to Jesus. Like, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. Like, I'm like, can I be in a meeting? You're always in meetings. When I call, you pick up. You're right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, but there's certain people that if they call, I pick up. Right? Or I call back. Like, I don't even need to check the voicemails. I'll call. Did you listen to my voicemail? Nah, what you need? Like, I call back. His family calls him out. He looks around. When he hears that they called him out, and he's sitting there, he says, here are my mother and my brothers, right here. Figurative language, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother, right? The cool thing I really like about this is because he had just got through calling those disciples up, saying he wanted them to be with him. So he's telling you, in order to get in his will, you have to be in proximity of him. There has to be some type of personal relationship. When it comes to Jesus, long distance doesn't work. <coughs> he is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Jesus' family did not recognize his authority. Jesus' family did not recognize his authority. And how often is that our story when it comes to our relationship with Christ? That Sundays happen, and we know that Sunday we come to church. For some of us, it can be out of routine. For some of us, it can be a job. For some of us, it could be, well, I had a bad week. Maybe I'll come and something good will happen. And then after Sunday, it stops there. Our Bibles stay closed for the rest of the week. The apps on our phone aren't open. And now I can go about what I, I filled up on Sunday, and I'm good to go. For the rest of the week, I should be good to Sunday, operating in my own strength, recognizing for myself that this is what I need. I am what I need. 
And so I can get through this week on my own, and I'll do my best. Jesus is calling us to be his family. Jesus is calling us to be his brothers and sisters. Jesus is calling us to make this thing personal so that we can do his will for our lives. And for some of us, say, well, that's extra, Joseph. I mean, I got to work. I got a family. I got all this. He's like, no, I need to be the center. All the things in your life need to flow through me. Then we'll get the list going if you want to get a list. He said, but first, pick me. And so my question for you today is this. Will you recognize Jesus? Will you recognize Jesus? Who he is in your life, what he's done in your life, and then be a witness to that. Will your relationship with him be personal? Or will your relationship with Jesus be something that you just do in passing? Do you recognize him moving in your lives? And so every week, unless we do a baptism, every week, we come and we do communion. And Chris comes up here, or I come, or James comes, and we break the bread and say, this is the body which has been broken for you. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of what Jesus did on this cro- the cross. Right? And then we come and we pick up the, the cups, wood, wine, glass, grape juice. And we dip our bread in it and we say, this, is, this represents the new covenant. The new covenant because of Christ's blood that was shed for us. It's a covering. Right? And we do this and... I've even asked the question, oh, why do we do communion so much? Every single week. I mean, I grew up, we did it once, first Sunday, or maybe last Sunday. That's it. That's enough, right? And I was praying about this, and I was like, Chris seems so excited. Is that authentic? Is that really real? Like, we can be that excited about doing that. Like, I remember what he did on the cross. I think about it all the time. You know, I'm thinking, like, do I need to take the bread? And he's like, no. I was like, okay. And so what, what really, I'm not going to say it just made it click, because I know. But I was watching a movie on Friday morning before my wife made plans. Uh, those that laugh, that means you're listening to me. Uh, and so we're watching this movie, and it's about this alien that is like a failure to his family. He has to come to Earth and take over Earth or something. Uh, and he meets some other animals in this that he says he conquered. He's trying to impress his father who has conquered 999 planets. And he tells his father that, hey, I conquered a planet. And the father comes down and says, you conquered a planet? He's like, yeah. But through his experience here on earth, he, would, he, he got to engage in friendships and relationships. And, and these animals, they loved him. And, and one of them gave him a hug and it did something to him where he started to change colors from the inside out and I couldn't help but think about what that means in a gospel relationship with Christ of how Jesus even in the parables that he's telling with the strong man how all he told stories like that because all they could see is the outside that's what made sense to them let me tell a story about someone that is strong and they'll get that picture And what he's trying to get them saying, he's like, you've never witnessed someone come from the inside and attack. And it began to change outwardly. And so this alien, then his dad comes and he was like, the dad comes and the son is, or the son is like, I can't, I can't really do this. He's like, well, I'll conquer this planet. And the dad goes and puts his star up and said, I conquered it. And he said, no, you haven't. Because there's one thing you haven't experienced. It's the strongest weapon of all. He's like, what is that? Is it this? He starts naming crazy weapons. He's like, no. He walks up to his dad, and he just gives him a hug. He just gives him a hug. And it's crazy. I'm like, man, this is just a cartoon. Why is it like I'm thinking all deep and stuff with this? It's crazy. These kids' cartoons. I'm just trying to have my family time. But he said, that's it. He said, the love of Christ, people have not experienced because they just don't know. Because you haven't witnessed it to them. And you see this father getting hugged by his son, and they don't hug, they don't show emotions, they don't have friendships, they don't show weakness. 
and the father begins to start shaking, like, let me go. Then tears begin to come down the father's eyes. And I begin to think about, you sent your only begotten son to die for me, God. And I can't imagine him taking on my sin and being separated from you. You imagine a father's love not just for his son, but for his creation and all of us. He said, I want you. I chose you not to just be advocates. He said, I want this to be real for you. Because until it's real for you, you can't talk about it with anyone else. You can't be a witness of what you've never witnessed before. So will you recognize me? Do you recognize Jesus in your life outside of a Sunday? Because this is good. We can cry, we can laugh, we can play here. But is it personal? Or do you, like many of us, sometimes say, oh, all right, Sunday was good, so Monday I'll be good. And then you just begin to go about your week and do what you want to do. And so before you take communion, before you, you, you stand up, and I, I want you to pray right now. Close your eyes right where you are and just ask God just to move, to reveal to you, to bring up, to prune anything that's not like him. Ask him for forgiveness if you need to ask for forgiveness. But I challenge you right now, just for a few seconds, to pray and ask God just to speak to your heart. Father God, we thank you. God, there is none like you. God, there is none that stands beside you. God, I pray right now as we take communion, God, that you would speak to the heart of your people. God, that you would move like only you can move. God, that you would operate like only you can operate. God, we need you like we never needed you before. And so my prayer right now, God, is that you would have your way in this service, God. God, that we begin to mature more and more, God, that you would increase the appetite within us. And so as we get ready to take communion, God, that we understand that this relationship that we have with you is personal. It's personal first, God. So God, will forever give you all the honor. God, will forever give you all the authority. God, we submit and we trust your authority in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The song says, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you've been so, so good. And we're singing that and we're worshiping God. And, but do we listen to the words that we're actually singing? My God, you're an awesome God. God, I can submit to your authority because all my life you've been faithful. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's brought me through, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Right, I don't want my love for Christ just to be lip service. I don't want my relationship with Christ just to be from a distance. I want to experience God. I want to have a personal relationship with him so that when I go out and I'm telling people about the goodness of Jesus and what he's brought me through, I can tell and testify because it's real to me. And so my challenge for you, not just this week, not just on tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday, is that this relationship with Christ becomes a personal relationship for you. That we're not just wanting this thing to be lip service. That we're, we're frustrated with the my glory and, and my good kind of mindset. We say, God, this to you be all the glory and all the honor. God, I give you the praise because you deserve it. God, I just want to be cast as just like an extra in this picture that is the movie of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. My prayer this week also is that we allow ourselves to trust God's plans for our lives. If it's on your job, if it's in your marriage, if it's in your parenting, trust God's plans for your lives. If you don't have a job, trust God's plans for your lives and believe that God has you. And when God asks you to inconvenience yourself, know that there was nothing convenient about the cross. 
And so I want you to go. I want you to have an awesome week of worship. And remember, God called you and God sent you. You are sent.